Get ready for an exciting episode of Prairie Sportsman. Join us as we explore a massive collection of eagles donated to the National Eagle Center, showcasing these majestic birds up close. Then, we'll check out Trout Unlimited's Fly Fishing Mentor Program, helping young anglers master the art of fly fishing. Hey everybody, I'm Brett Amundsen. Welcome to Prairie Sportsman. We got a great show for you this week, and it all starts right now. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open, Western Minnesota Prairie Waters and the members of Pioneer PBS. The American Eagle is our nation's most powerful symbol, revered by native people for carrying prayers to the Great Spirit by all Americans for representing courage, strength, and freedom. The story of the majestic raptor's place in our natural and cultural world is told in a small Minnesota town in the Mississippi River at the National Eagle Center in Wabasha. National Eagle Center started as Eagle Watch in the late 80s when people in the community, local volunteers, enthusiasts, started seeing eagles come back to this region. Most bald eagles migrate to warm climates in the fall, but in Wabasha, rapid currents keep Mississippi waters open and eagles can catch their fish year round. The popularity of eagle watching in Wabasha led to Congress designating it as the site of the National Eagle Center in 1999. We got our first director, bought a storefront on Main Street, and Harriet became the iconic first eagle of the National Eagle Center. She became a world-renowned phenomenon. She went to Twin Towers, she went to, uh, she was on Today shows, CBS News, she was just the iconic eagle and telling the story of the return of eagles. Local people, totally volunteer driven, raised the money to build this center. It opened in 2007 um, to over 100,000 guests its first couple of years, every year. It's been averaging 80,000 people a year since that time. We have a great partnership with Prairie Island Indian community. They have supported us since this building was built. Chief Wapahasha is on that fountain because this was their homeland. The eagle is their connection to God. Eagles carry their prayers to the Creator. Eagles carry the, their ancestors' souls up to the skies. Eagles are essential to their lifestyle, to their religion, and to their beliefs. They've helped us build state-of-the-art eagle care, and they're starting to share materials with us from their culture, share their stories. One example we have in the building right now is a buffalo hide. It tells the story of eagles and their connection to the creator. It also tells the history of eagles and humans. It tells the history of eagles and the flood, all on one buffalo hide, a couple at Prairie Island created the staff for us. It is the Eagle Nation staff. It has otter fur, it has willow, it has a dream weaver that took the female elder four days to weave for us. 
and they created this as a gift to the center, symbolizing the connection between us, the Dakota community, and building upon that relationship. One of the center's earliest visitors, Preston Cook of California, is fascinated with the eagle as an American symbol. After he left the U.S. Army in 1966, he snipped the buttons from his uniform and decided he would collect all things eagle. In those days, I would go to an antique shop where they would ask, what do you collect? And I'd say, well, I collect things with eagles. And the usual response was, we don't have anything. So I'd look around the store and and I'd put some things on the counter and they all had an eagle on it. And one was a pin, one was a button, one was a postcard, and you know, one may be a shirt with an eagle on the back of it, and I'd buy it all. So I started going to flea markets. So I just would buy the 10 cent item, the dollar item, the $50 item, the $100 item. And then when the eBay came around for me, which was I think in 1999, then I plugged into eBay and a variety of other auction houses on, on the internet. Well, I spent really all of my adult life from the time I was 20 until now, I'll be 76 next week, collecting eagles. So I married when I was 40 for the first time. So I brought an aging cat into the marriage and I brought an eagle collection into the marriage and she brought five kids and two grandchildren. So that was our trade-off. Because I say you can't have too many eagles, and she says, you can have too many eagles. Because the collection now is some 40,000 individual pieces in the collection, so it probably represents the largest collection ever assembled, I would even say worldwide. When I started acquiring thousands of items, uh, I realized I was onto something. I felt, okay, I've got this wonderful collection that represents America. It's patriotism, it's symbolism. It's of the natural bird. The collection we have here, you see a little bit of Autobahn, but I have hundreds. Once the collection started getting large, finding out that there were few collectors, that there was no museum, there was no repository dedicated to the bald eagle, let alone eagles anywhere in the world, I decided that I needed to do something about that. So I traveled from Alaska to the Atlanta coast and tried to determine a good location that the Eagle uh, collection should land. I think it was 2003 when I first came back here. And um, I kind of landed here and I liked the town, I liked the people, I liked the involvement, I liked the volunteerism here. And they had an Eagle Center. After the Eagle Center opened its new 15,000 square foot building in 2007, Preston offered to donate his collection to the nonprofit. That encouraged a drive to go from the local community to the state of Minnesota, created a bonding measure that went to the state, was approved for $8 million for us to expand the Eagle Center. First time that kind of money has ever come into this part of the state. The Eagle Center added an amphitheater, built a new dock for boat visitors, and purchased five buildings on Main Street. That opened more exhibit space for items in Preston's collection, including drawings by John James Audubon, an artist and ornithologist who set out to record all of North America's bird species. His 1820 drawing of a bald eagle with a goose, six years later changed to a catfish, more reflective of the raptor's actual diet. And what a lot of people don't understand about Audubon is he took extensive field notes. So he would go around out in the wilds, which is just amazing when you read about it, that this man just went out and grew all of these birds, 435 birds. I mean, he would walk sometimes 50 miles. He would camp out at night. That's an amazing story about what the, the dedication of this man and how much time and energy and devotion he put into this project because it was a lifetime of work. What we have here is a eagle that is a piece of ephemera. It was supposed to be used for a day or two uh, in FDRs. It's Franklin Delano Roosevelt's 
third inauguration in 1941. And it was to be used just on a viewing stand in front of the White House and then disassembled and thrown out. But the person that was to take it down, who took it down, took the eagle home and kept it. I bought this from the grandson of the person that put the viewing stand up and then took it down. This, this is my book, American Eagle, and it, it shows about 1,430 items in the collection. I have dozens of comic books with images of the eagle, sometimes being the good guy, carrying Tarzan, or down here with Captain Marvel, but here with Superman attacking Superman. So sometimes we see it attacking animals, like here Lassie, or here little Abner. So sometimes the eagle is portrayed in a positive light and sometimes as a predator in a negative light. Preston has some of the best of the best of the best, but he wants everything. If it has an eagle on it, it's good enough for him. He has never sold an item. He has been offered hundreds of thousands of dollars to, for people to buy items for him. He refuses to let it go. One story that he told me um, when we were pulling together the items for the exhibit was about this doorknob. He went through a huge battle online auction because he had so many people that wanted this doorknob. He ended up buying it not knowing its history. He just knew that a lot of people wanted it, so that meant he had to have it. He goes back and researches it and finds out by the American Doorknob Collectors Association, it was from the executive building in DC, and if you have that doorknob in your collection, you have the pinnacle of doorknob collections. Certain people touched it during the history of that building. That's what makes museums special. We tell stories. During a visit to a California art museum, Preston met Bonnie Coor, who recycles books into art. He asked what she could do with a damaged copy of his book. I came back a couple of weeks later and she had this drawing of an eagle wing. Uh, with an American flag on it from 1858, which represents the statehood and the new star from Minnesota. It is a piece of aluminum that's perforated with probably a thousand different holes in it. And she sliced the different pages to get the coloring to weave through each of these holes. Bonnie feels that she's the only one that does this kind of altered art, altered book art. So it's a magnificent piece. And then she decided to donate it to the National Eagle Center. Because the Eagle Center can only display a fraction of Preston's collection, he purchased a warehouse and retrofitted it with temperature and humidity controls and a security system. The building is filled with everything Eagle, from shaving mugs and beer bottles to hockey pucks and movie posters. This was a 1939 movie and the girl who is the daughter of the producer or director of the movie, actually took his two-year-old daughter and put her on a guy wire 50 feet in the air, had an eagle tied to her, and just to get this picture of an eagle taking a child away. You could never get away with that today. I wonder if she had any lasting uh, problems because of that encounter when she was two. This is an original Warhol, and this was done in 1983. Warhol did a series, um, Endangered Species, and he did 10 different species. And then we have items like this life preserver off the Potomac, which was FDR's presidential yacht. Preston will go the distance to get what he wants. When he learned that Buzz Aldrin was on an Antarctica cruise, Preston booked a trip there so he could get the astronaut's signature on an Apollo 11 photo. This is the only version that he's ever signed call himself the Eagle pilot because he was the Eagle pilot of the Eagle Lunar Module.
If people care about eagles from whatever direction, whether it's a live bird or it's a screaming eagle patch on a military uniform, people are gonna have different connections. We know that eagles inspire people. They're a symbol of strength, perseverance, importance, cultural connectivity, history, art. So we are leaning into that addition to our story. Minnesota Trout Unlimited's mission is to conserve, protect, and restore the state's cold water fisheries. Fly fishing for trout depends on sustaining cold, clean water habitats. That's why members are introducing the sport to the next generation of environmental stewards. So the Foster to the Outdoors program dates back to 2017. Tim Hempstead is the individual who dreamed up this idea of getting kids, number one, out in nature, but connected to fly fishing. And since that time, there have been quite a few kids who've gone through the program. This is our first year back since the pandemic. Everybody's thrilled uh, to be getting kids back out fly fishing and getting to know and love the outdoors. Foster the Outdoors is a volunteer-run program that starts in May. Youth and their guardians meet up with mentors at Phelan Park in St. Paul. We're adults who know some stuff and we want to share it with you. Um, you guys are the mentees, that means you're kids who want to learn some stuff. Make sense? Participants are split into three groups that rotate through three stations. At one, kids are introduced to trout fishing regulations, maps, and other resources. At another station, youth learn how to tie knots. Teachers use yarn that's easier to handle and learn with than fishing line. Line them up. Okay. And now twist it yeah, five times. It one, two. Okay. Okay, so put your tag in through so we don't lose any the space. bottom hole. Let me just get okay. And now if you look where the top is, put it through the top hole. Perfect. And now just pull on the long one. And now the hard part is we gotta... Ha ha! Uh, you got it. That's a beautiful knot. Yeah, you got it. And then we slide it down. That's perfect. <laughs> the biggest challenge is learning to cast. This is, this is fly fishing, boys and girls. Step one is a lift. Step two is a pause. Step three is a drop. So one, two, three. Lift, pause, forward. You guys give it a try. Oh my gosh, you're doing it. I want you to go and now do a hard flick. Nice. Lift, pause, forward. Lift, pause, forward, keep practicing. The more straight your line goes out, the better you're doing it. Okay. Okay, keep working on it. Slow down. This isn't a woo, 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 woo. It, you're, you're not lassoing a horse. So on, you're going, you're going, you're not arching your back like I am. I'm making it exaggerated. What I want you to do, watch me for a sec. Up here, not all the way back. Yes, yes. At first there's the struggling with the casting, but then there's that, I think I got it. I think I got it. Yeah, I can do this. I would say 100% of these kids have fished before. I would say very few of them and only a couple of their parents have fly fished before. And that's what, uh, as mentors, as teachers, is part of our challenge, casting a spinning rod the lure has the weight and it takes the line out. So you have to then reverse that logic that all these kids and adults have ingrained in themselves and realize that the fly has no weight, the weight is in the line. So hey kids and adults, that line has to go out first or that fly's never going anywhere.
After about an hour of lessons, participants head to the water with fly rods on loan from Trout Unlimited. Mentees and guardians will use them to fish with their mentors over the summer. Today, they'll be fishing for sunfish, not trout. One of the most important things we're trying to do is get them action. Let's face it, a sunny is a lot easier to catch than a trout. And that's really why we take the kids to lakes and parks where hopefully there's sunnies, crappies, easy to catch fish. As we're learning today, not always easy to catch. They're not always there. But that's why we call it fishing, not catching. Today, what we did is we had the kids focus on dry flies. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First and foremost, they can see their success. Watching a fish come up from below the surface, out of nowhere, and all of a sudden, bam, it hits that dry fly. And anyone who's ever experienced that, that's nirvana. That's what you're really hoping for. That's what keeps us coming back. On the front end, it's challenging. I joked, if this was easy, everybody would do it. Some kids, they like that challenge. Once you get past this initial learning curve, there's a peace, a calm that, that comes from the places that the trout take you. They need clean water. Clean water doesn't happen in polluted places. So the trout take us to beautiful places, um, sometimes surprisingly close to and running right through cities. Uh, River Falls, Wisconsin is a great example. There's a world-class stream, the Kinnikinnick River, that runs right through River Falls. And it's, you know, 45 minutes from the Twin Cities. Some of the kids hook sunnies, but Kai has the big catch of the day. It's a pike! Oh my gosh! Oh my! Oh! This is a big catch of the day for our Wow! Too bad we don't have a bucket for it. How cool is that? Whoa! Awesome! Yes! The one thing I don't like about fish is that they're very slimy. <laughs> they are. And they, it gets all over your hands. How awesome is that? Wow, that's that is cool. so cool. I got to see him come up and take that fly. Yeah. Just inhaled it. Yeah. Nice biggest. job, Kai. That is amazing. Wow. This guy's got lots of teeth. You ever seen the inside of this guy's mouth? No. Lots of teeth. Hang on. Nice, right? Want to help That's me let it go? That's the bigger fish I've caught. You hold his tail? Mm -hmm. We've all caught fish. We've all gotten that buzz, so to speak, of catching a fish. But if you've ever watched someone that you taught how to catch a fish on a fly rod, you now have a higher level of just appreciation for, wow, that's a good day. That's, woof, that's a home run. These young people, as they get older, will also learn that it's a great solitary sport. I grew up doing all kinds of fishing and boats and motors were involved and things like that. And I remember a lot of days not doing a lot of fishing with dad working on the boat a lot. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that with fly fishing. It's a rod, a reel, some flies, you and the water. Yeah, nice. Got wrapped all the way forward. Besides fishing with mentors, Foster the Outdoors offers a fly tying course in October and a visit to a fly shop in January. Trout Unlimited markets the program at the Great Waters Fly Fishing Expo in March through its Trout in the Classroom program where students raise and release trout and by reaching out to youth organizations, rec centers, and Big Brothers Big Sisters. We really try and have everybody signed up by March 30th. We can be a little bit flexible on that. As we grow it, one of our goals is to not just grow it in numbers, but diversity of people benefiting from it. The opportunities are infinite for the future and that's, uh, you know, that's part of the growth. Uh, gender diversity and also racial diversity uh, within the, the pool of both mentors and mentees. 
because everybody should have an opportunity to benefit, um, and everybody can. I'm always about, it's not just fishing, it's about nature. Let's point out what's out there. Let's look at the turtles, let's look at the muskrats. I uh, was paired up with a young man, young boy named Max. What was my favorite part about uh, Max was he's beaten me to it. There's an eagle, he's like, Kevin, there's an eagle. I'm like, yeah, cool. And did you see the turtles? And I saw a muskrat. I'm like, oh yeah, me too. I'm like, oh, wow, you're doing my job for me. And he just, his, his enthusiasm for nature was infectious. Really our secret mission here is to get these young people digging this, really into it, and then they become the next generation of us. People who care enough about the resource to make sure it's protected. Funding for Prairie Sportsman is provided by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources, and by Mark and Margaret yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farm, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota, on the web at shalomhillfarm.org, and by Live Wide Open, Western Minnesota Prairie Waters and the members of Pioneer PBS. So the flag here was in the White House in the Carter administration, and it's the presidential seal. So this is the presidential seal, which differs a bit from the great seal. So you see the 50 stars? That's the main difference. But since Harry Truman in 1945 changed the direction of the head, the head is now conforms to the great seal with the eagle head facing the olive branch. So sometimes they call this the, the Truman Seal because he's responsible for that. <laughs>